This is Caffeinate Your Career, a series where I get to ask experts all the questions you want to know. Today I'm chatting with Nick Allen from the United Way of the Greater Triangle. He's the Chief Programs Officer there and he does some really important work uplifting communities. So let's get into it. Okay, so thank you so much for being here with us today, Nick. I'm excited to chat with you a little bit more. So we're just going to get started. Do some rapid icebreakers, okay? You ready? I'm ready. First thing that comes to your head, just answer with that. Okay. Okay. Your favorite restaurant in the Triangle? I'm in love with the Salt Box, seafood restaurant. Okay. And your favorite sneaker, because you always walk around with nice sneakers. I do. My, my current favorite are a pair of Jordan 4s. Okay. Uh, Oreo. Nice. I call them Oreos. When were those released? Um, They were re-released uh, probably a year ago. Okay. Uh, but they're new to me, and I love them. Nice. And last one, what has been your favorite age so far? My favorite age so far? Uh, I would say right now. Okay. Right. Uh, I think over the past year, family-wise, professional, um, has been the most exciting and dynamic uh, time for me. And so, and I always like to live in the moment, right? Yeah. So, like, I hope to make my current year the best year ever. I like that. Like that. That was that was good. <laughs> okay, so now I'm just gonna kind of get people up to speed on your background, yeah. just understand what you do. So, can you talk a little bit about United Way and what you guys do upstairs? Yeah. So, United Way has been around for 135 years, right? And so, unless you've lived under a rock, you have probably come across our logo, the name, mm -hmm. uh, a commercial during a football game, or something like that. Uh, but essentially, what we do, uh, boiled down very simply, is that we raise money in our local market, so we're in the triangle here, Orange, Durham, Wake, and Johnston counties. And then we distribute that money to uh, mission-aligned uh, nonprofit organizations and impact work uh, in that same footprint. Uh, our mission is to eradicate poverty and increase social mobility through the power of partnerships. And so uh, you could imagine that is a wide uh, range of, of work and opportunities and partnerships that we have. Uh, but we partner with local individuals, local companies and corporations uh, to find what they're passionate about and what they want to invest in. And then we find the best and brightest uh, impact work in nonprofits in the triangle to deliver uh, resources, not just money, but resources in the form of money, uh, time that people want to give, uh, their expertise that they want to give to ensuring that uh, our community, everybody has what they need. Mm -hmm. So y'all are kind of like a one-stop shop, right? So if I was like, you know, I have all these causes that are near and dear to my heart. I don't know how to get into donating or volunteering my time. I don't know how to split it up. We could just come to United Way and donate to y'all and y'all could disperse. Absolutely. I mean, you know, we make it very easy. If, if, you, if you're not sure exactly what organization that you want to give to, uh, you can trust us uh, to make that decision for you. But also, if you know uh, a particular organization that you care about and that you're passionate about, uh, we can make uh, facilitate giving uh, very easily in that way as well. And so you can give directly to that organization through us uh, and, and just to simplify uh, people's support. Cool. That's awesome work. So can you just give some examples of the programs that you oversee since you're the chief program officer? Yeah, so, uh, you know, I, I mentioned that our mission is to eradicate poverty and increase social mobility. Uh, and, there, you know, key, le uh, key levers of poverty include uh, early childhood care um, and, and, and education, graduation rates, uh, access to healthy and nutritious food, uh, affordable housing, everything from homelessness to affordable home ownership, uh, and then also access to, to mental health uh, services, uh, specifically uh, mental health services that address kind of the, the, the outcomes associated with living in impoverished environments. And so um, we have a three-pillar strategic approach, um, cradle to career, which is first trimester to and through college and or career for young people and their families. Uh, and then healthy families, which includes the, the food work, uh, the housing work, uh, and the mental health work. And then our third pillar is what we call equity and leadership. Um, we believe that you can't be anti-poverty without being anti-racist. There are some very clear correlations between race uh, and poverty and social mobility. And so we wanted to make sure that we addressed race in our solutions, prioritized racial uh, and gender equity in a way that we uh, not only uh, invest our dollars uh, in the services that are provided, but also in our own portfolio, right? Like there was a huge disparity between who was being served 
um, through our investments and who was leading the nonprofit organizations uh, that we were investing in. And so we created some intentional and specific opportunities uh, to decrease those disparities, to be more inclusive of uh, BIPOC-led uh, nonprofit uh, organizations, and specifically to empower uh, BIPOC uh, nonprofit leaders. Uh, in, in, the, in the triangle. Yeah, that's amazing. So what has been one of your favorite projects or programs that you've worked on? One of my favorite projects or programs. Um, I think the, the most uh, recognizable brand um, in our equity work is, is a program that we call Tend to Watch, uh, where we, we, we've uh, identified uh, 10 leaders, uh, uh, women and or uh, people of color, and um, created kind of the uh, easy funding mechanism uh, where uh, they fill out an application. Um, and then we also do in-person interviews, which really personalize and humanizes our work in ways that we don't typically do uh, in the nonprofit space. Uh, and it was really an opportunity to, to get to know these leaders, right? Um, leaders that are often uh, not heard from, uh, don't have the, the loudest microphone or the biggest uh, bullhorn. Uh, and so getting to know these folks, I think, has been uh, incredibly rewarding. And then also uh, using our platform and our network to d introduce the general community uh, to, to these leaders um, has been an incredible thing to watch uh, and to see their work blossom and to see their recognition blossom, um, not necessarily because of us, but to be a part of that work, I think, has, has been some of the most rewarding things I've done uh, in my career. Yeah, that sounds really cool. It's fun. So if we take some steps back and we go back to whenever you were in college at UNC, you studied exercise and sports science, correct? I did. Okay, so how does that relate to your current role or roles that you've held in the past? Um, first of all, go Tar Heels. Second of <laughs> all, um, you know, I, I, I fancied myself an athlete. Uh, that was part of my personal identity growing up. Uh, so it was decided what I wanted to be around uh, kind of in the formal academic setting, right? And I. Uh, when I was in college, I, I, I envisioned myself working around sports, working in sports. Uh, and my first job out of school uh, was with uh, a Parks and Recreation Department. And so I assumed that I would get a building with a gym and a pool and a weight room. Mm -hmm. uh, and instead, uh, I was placed in what they call a neighborhood center, which is basically a two-room building in the middle of a low-resource community with no amenities. And what I recognized pretty quickly is that people didn't come because of the amenities. They came because of the relationships that they had with me and my staff. And so that was kind of my introduction to community work. Uh, and I was pretty lucky early on to kind of find that passion. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, 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 and so um, ever since then, I've kind of pursued uh, this, this, this angle of um, how can I get close as possible to community? How can I empower folks? How can I build relationships? Um, how can I uh, make sure that people are heard and active participants in uh, the, 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 the life around them? Uh, and, and that has evolved um, many different iterations since then. But my start was in that, park, that parks and recreation work in the neighborhood center. Yep. What sports did you play? Uh, baseball and basketball. Okay, I was um, gonna guess basketball. Yeah. But I didn't know. Yeah, you know, um, don't let the hype fool you. I, I, I loved basketball more than I loved baseball, but I was much better at baseball than basketball. Yeah, that's how I felt. I played softball in college, but yeah. I loved volleyball more, but I just wasn't as good to play in college. So Absolutely. I went the softball route. Absolutely. Um, so the next thing that I wanted to ask you about was tasks that you do in your role. So what tasks did you gravitate towards the most whenever you were just going throughout your career? Were there things like, oh, I definitely want to do more of that? You know, I think um, so often when you're in uh, a profession that serves community, uh, community voice is left out of decisions, right? I think oftentimes you'll find professionals in whatever space making decisions in a room um, absent from uh, the people uh, who you're intending to impact. And so every opportunity that I got to really talk with people, to, to, to understand not only like what was wrong, but more importantly, what was right, right? What were people's dreams? Um, and being inspired by that um, was, was something that I, I, I sought in every um, professional opportunity that I had. Uh, and so um, you know, I think 
no matter what happens next for me, um, you know, the further away I get from direct service and from community, the more I have to be very intentional about holding on to never kind of um, losing the, the opportunity or, or my perspective on uh, the work that we do and what's most important. Cool. So I kind of want to go into um, a day in your life next since we started talking about some tasks that you do. So what would you say is a day or a week like in your life, in your current role? Well, it, it starts out with my other full-time job. I have a three-and-a-half-year-old and a one-and-a-half-year-old. One okay. So, so getting folks ready in the morning and getting them off to school and daycare um, is, is, is better than coffee. Okay. Right. Uh, but, but by the time I get home and get settled, um, you know, I have the distinct pleasure of working alongside uh, an incredible team. So the work that I do um, includes um, the way that we invest uh, our marketing and storytelling, our community and volunteer engagement, and a new piece of work uh, that we call Neighborhood Impact. So I have you know, uh, seven or eight folks that I work with very intimately to, to do that work. Uh, and so um, you know, in a lot of ways, the best part of my, my job um, is serving them. Right, empowering them, making sure they have what they need to be uh, to, to be the best versions of themselves. Uh, and so, a lot of my work is is, is around um, uh, supporting supporting some incredible uh, leaders and people in the nonprofit space. That's awesome. So you get to do a lot of face to face interaction. Are you on your computer a lot? I am on my computer uh, quite often. Um, I tell people all the time that we're in the people business. Right? And it's so easy to get locked into a spreadsheet or get locked into a Zoom meeting that's, you know, you're talking to an a, a, a image on a screen. Um, but, you know, when I can, um, I often prefer to have person-to-person -person interaction if it's safe and, and, and healthy to do so. Um, but it also allows me to remember that we're in the people business. Uh, and so there's, there's lots of uh, conversations um, there's lots of meetings. Uh, I try to, 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 to make those as um, fun as possible. Um, I think when you're in, a, in, a, in a, a line of work where you talk about very serious things like racism and poverty, um, you can tend to just be serious all the time, right? And I think uh, if there's no levity, um, if there's no humor uh, in, in the conversations and the work that you do every single day, it could be, it could create an unhealthy environment. And so um, I, I tend to lean that way in, in, in all the meetings and all the conversations that I have, um, but also when it's time to get busy and serious, um, we can also do that. Yeah, you can do both. Absolutely. Nice. So that's kind of what I was gonna get into um, in one of the next questions. I was gonna ask how doing this work impacts your personal life. So do you like bring work home with you a lot of the time? Uh, you know, it's hard to turn it off, right? Um, I am certainly a, a, a passion-driven person, and so that's not something that you just hit the on-off switch. Uh, and you know, I think the work that we do, uh, and the work that I do, is inspired by my environment, right? So um, you can't drive around, you can't um, go out to eat, you can't interact with your own children without making these connections between uh, the world that we want to live in, the world that we're living in now and what my role is in helping us get there. Uh, and so in a, in a lot of ways, I'm motivated to create a world and an environment uh, where my children um, and their friends and my friends' children um, are successful and are able to pursue their dreams in ways that we haven't been able to do before. And so um, absolutely, you bring it home with you, right? But you also have to make sure that, um, I have to make sure that I'm healthy uh, and I think you have to be in the right mind state uh, to, to, to provide your best foot forward. And so there's a lot of self-care involved in that. Um, there's a lot of uh, processing with people in your circle um, so that you just don't carry that burden. This is not my job to eradicate poverty, right? I just want to recognize that I'm a, a, a piece of the puzzle um, that's been, been built for generations and generations before me. And will be, be and will and will be built for generations and generations after me, um, but I just want to make sure that I'm uh, positioned to do all that I can uh, to be a part of that work. Yeah. So, what do you do for self care? Do you work out? Like, do you journal? What are your like go to things? I cook. Oh, 
Okay, what do you cook? Well, well, it it stemmed from my love of eating. Okay. Right, and um, I didn't have, like, you know, if I didn't have somebody to cook for me, I had to create it myself. And so um, that's kind of how I uh, developed my love for cooking. Um, I've been doing it for, um, since I was a, a teenager. Uh, and so it, it's really an opportunity for me to cre- want, create. I love to create things. I'm a, um, a closet artist, right? Okay. And so like I like to create and I like to take something from nothing and create something and show it to my family or give it to my family as an expression of love. Um, and you know, the act of cooking, I think, is kind of like you know, keeping your hands busy. My mind can wander and explore ideas and dreams that I have. Um, but while keeping my hands busy. Um, what do I like to cook? It's very uh, cyclical, right? Like I get in um, uh, certain types of food and I'll dive very deeply into it and make people sick by eating the same thing over and over and over again and I'll switch to something yeah. else. Uh, but as the weather warms up, I love to get on the grill. Um, I love to, to get on the smoker. Um, I, I can wax poetic about all types of uh, gadgets uh, that I have that, um, that, that, make, that makes food taste good. Um, but that's really kind of my, if I weren't doing this, I would be a chef. Okay. Does your family feel the same? Are they like, yes, this food is so good, please keep cooking? Or are they like, mm, you missed the mark on this one? I, I have a very loving family. Uh, so even when I do miss the mark, they don't they don't they don't tell me very often. But I think I think the food's pretty good, and I think they're satisfied with okay. with what I give them. Nice. Yep. Um, so back to the work that you that you do. Can you just talk about some of the challenges that you face on a regular basis? Challenges. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I mean, you know, that mission is not something to be taken lightly, right? Um, and so I, I think one of the biggest challenges is like, how do you take something so big? and break it down into something where you could actually make um, your next step meaningful. Uh, And so it's really, uh, you know, breaking down and asking the the, the critical questions of like, why does poverty exist? Um, And and then figuring out what our role is to do that, right? You know, we're responsible for um, several million dollars um, invested annually in the triangle. and even that large amount of money um, is not going to be the only way that we eradicate poverty. I tell people all the time that we're not going to spend our way out of poverty. And so we have to be creative in the way that we tell stories, in the way that we fa- facilitate experiences for people to get close to the work and to, um, and to be proximate to people and families and relationships that they normally wouldn't be to really raise their awareness and consciousness so that they live differently, right? Um, And so it's the coordination of investment, storytelling, and volunteer and community engagement. How do you put those things in a way uh, that that helps us us achieve our mission? And that is quite the the Rubik's Cube to solve for. And so I think that's kind of like the the, the biggest daily challenge is figuring that out. Uh, when you're trying to shift people's mindsets and consciousness, mm. people are resistant to that. Yeah. Right. So you have to figure out a way to meet people where they are, um, to appeal to what their needs and passions are, uh, but also move them along a continuum of, of understanding uh, to where you feel like uh, would be beneficial to the community. And that's also you know, part of the puzzle in the Rubik's Cube that we're solving for every day. Okay, and then on the other end of that, what do you love the most about what you do? You probably already touched on it a little bit, but is there anything else you want to mention? Um, I love to see people grow. I love to see uh, the community around me shift and change. Um, that's slow work sometimes, right? So if you wanted to use like a, a cooking analogy, um, it's hard to bake bread in a microwave. Right, like there's there's a certain amount of patience, and perspective, um, and and stick to itiveness that you need in this work because change is not instant. And so when you see that change um, over time, uh, it's incredibly rewarding. Uh, and so that I think that's one of the things that um, drives me and motivates me because you don't win every day, 
right? Like, I'm, uh, there's no way that we're successful or we see change or impact every single day. Um, but, but when you do see it, it's, it, it's something to celebrate and, and it's something to, to try to replicate. And, 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 uh, and so that's kind of my, my happy place. Okay. Now, do you get your kids involved at all, like with volunteering, whenever you guys have volunteering opportunities and things? Well, you know, they're, they're a little young. So, I mean, they've been present but they haven't uh, been active participants. Yeah. But certainly um, we'll raise my children in a way uh, where they're aware of the environment around them, they're aware of their community, where they value relationships, um, where they care about um, other people, where they're empathetic um, to other people's circumstances. Uh, and that's, cer that's certainly gonna be a, a, a you know, part of the way that we, uh, moving forward, provide opportunities for them uh, to grow and learn. You know, I think um, so much emphasis is put on, like, the formal learning environment, right? School and college and post-grad and all this kind of stuff. And I think um, oftentimes what we do is we miss the opportunity to learn from the world around us. And so I want to make sure that we build a balance in my children of um, prioritizing the formal academic space, but more importantly, uh, making sure that you learn every day from the world around you. Mm -hmm. I love that. So now I kind of want to go into the next section of this. So I feel like if people are watching still at this point, they've decided, okay, this guy's kind of cool. I like the work that he does. I think I want to be involved with something like that. So I kind of want to get into advice that you would have for those people who decide they want to get into this. So what character traits would they need to be successful? What character traits? You know, I think um, I've, I've seen the most successful people um, incredibly passionate about uh, things in their life, right? I think that's a personality trait where people kind of like latch on to something and dig very deeply into it. Um, you know, I think that you have to be a people person. Um, there's a lot of interaction and engagement and conversations and relationships that are very important to being successful in the work that we do. Uh, and so whatever that looks like for an individual, um, you have to be able to build those relationships. Um, I think creativity uh, is incredibly important. Uh, we, we live in a world that tells you this is the way things are, and the work that we do um, forces you to reimagine and envision a world that we have never seen before. And so the only way that you do that uh, I think is by accessing uh, the creative spaces of your brain, um, questioning the world around you, asking why, being willing to have tough conversations, uh, I, I think are all kind of important personality traits when we talk about being successful in, in this nonprofit work. What skills would you say that people need whenever starting out? So if I'm like looking for an entry level job, what skills should I be prepared to talk about in the interview? Yeah, you know, I, I mentioned earlier kind of this formal academic space and kind of the world academic space. Um, so there's certainly, you know, written communication, verbal communication, kind of these formalized ways, skill building, capacity building type opportunities. Um, but I also think that there are some, some soft, like the soft skills are just as important. Um, I think you have to be able to, um, to, to observe. I think you need to be able to um, analyze that observation. Uh, I think you have to be able to um, take that, uh, that observation and your analysis and kind of run it through your own experience. And then you, I think you need to be able to communicate that in your own words. Uh, in a way that um, feels human and feels genuine. Because what we need, I think, is more people um, that are pouring themselves into the work and less people that are just kind of like formally uh, following an academic structure. Uh, but, uh, and not to discredit or, or uh, devalue the academic pieces of it, but I, I absolutely think that it is a um, equal playing field when we talk about skills um, that, that make you successful in this line of work. How about grant writing? Because I feel like when I was looking at jobs and things, I saw a lot about grant writing. Do people need to be able to know how to do that? Or is that something they would be able to learn 
in the job? What's your take on that? Yeah, you know, the, the way that we position it is that um, we call it storytelling, right? We tell stories in the way that we communicate interpersonally with, you know, people in the hallway or people in your office, um, or when you're writing a grant to a funder, right? All you're doing is telling them a story. And I think, one, you need to, uh, you really need to understand the story that you're telling. But two, you need to understand your audience, right? You need to be able to say, okay, this is what they care about, and here's how I can position what I care about in their view in a way that's gonna resonate and compel them to be supportive and to be a part of your work. Uh, and so, yeah, grant writing is, you know, a part of what we do, um, but I think it's more about storytelling. Can you tell a good story? And can you write it down on paper? And can you compel people to be, and, and, and inspire people uh, to be a part of your work? Okay. How could people start building skills now? Do you have any tips for like where they can find jobs or volunteer opportunities? Um, yeah, you know, I think um, nonprofit organizations across the triangle are always willing to um, engage people in opportunities to learn, whether it be through internships um, or volunteering um, or even part-time jobs, right? Uh, and I think it, it serves people well um, to formalize in their head what they want to do, but you got you to gotta get your hands dirty. Right? Like you got to experience it, you got to be proximate to it, um, you got to learn from that um, to really test those assumptions of, okay, what do I want to do with my life? Uh, and so once you go through that testing process, you really get to narrow down um, very specifically uh, what brings you joy and what feeds your passions. Um, and so that's what I would you know, uh, recommend people do as a next step is get close to the thing that you want to be get close to the thing that you want to do, to really understand it. Um, I think a lot of times uh, young folks will declare very early on, I want to be this and I want to be that, and you go through all these steps, you spend all this money in school, you graduate, and then you get in the actual work and you realize it wasn't what you thought it was. And then a lot of times you're painted into a corner and forced to do something that you made a decision on 10 years ago. Uh, and so I think, you know, just being iterative in the way that you assess um, what you want to do, what makes you happy, ask that question constantly. Like, what makes me happy? Um, and and when, when you find that answer, finding what you want to do is easy. That's awesome. I got a, some advice a few years back from somebody I was doing an informational interview with, um, and she told me, have a list, create a list of things that you like, things you don't like. It can be with every job that you do or just in general. And I've been doing that. And every time that I look for a new job, I go to the list of things that I like and I'm like, okay, is there at least five of these things up here that I'm going to be doing? So that's been helpful. Um, but now I want to talk about the degree piece because you've touched on formal education a little bit. Do you think that people need a bachelor's degree to get into this industry? Do you need one? Absolutely not. I think uh, we've set up uh, structures uh, in the professional space um, as filters. Um, we've prioritized and valued certain type of learning over other types of learning. Uh, and it really hasn't done us, served us well. Yeah. Uh, and so I think what you're seeing now in the sector is a shift, a reprioritization of what matters and what doesn't. Um, and hopefully I think you know, we'll get to a, a, a space where um, we're evaluating whole people and not just kind of their, their resumes. Um, but absolutely, uh, you know, I think college um, is an excellent learning opportunity, both formally and informally. Uh, and so certainly aren't pushing people away from a formalized learning experience, um, but I also think it's important to be real with folks and say that um, there's less of a priority on kind of the formalized degrees. Uh, you know, you can take a look at my team and the work that we do is eradicating poverty and increasing social mobility. There is no major on my team of poverty eradication, right? Uh, 
But there are absolutely skills that you can learn from the formal academic space that you bring into the professional space. Um, but I think more importantly is like, do you care about the world around you? Um, what passions or skills um, can you share in the pursuit of these uh, solutions for our community? Um, I think lived experience uh, is a is a undervalued um, piece of work when we're making you know decisions around um, hiring, mm -hmm. right? Like how do you get to um, the school of hard knocks, right? Can you put that on a resume? Sure, but like how do you have conversations and learn about people to really understand what they're fully bringing to the position? What is their lived experience? Um, what gaps is that lived experience filling uh, that the academic formal um, degree does not provide? Okay. So you really got to get out there, get going with some internships or volunteer opportunities, whatever, just to kind of get the experience and see what you like, what you don't like. If you want to go the college route, that's an option you can learn there too, but it's not required necessarily. Right. Go to college route. Right, but I also think that you need to focus on building your whole self, right? I think people focus on get good grades, graduate, um, and if you're not building and putting that same type of energy into building your full self as a human, um, you're missing an opportunity to really position yourself to do what you want to do in this world. Awesome. Thanks for sharing that. So what would be like a top position that someone could hold in nonprofit organizations or programs per se. Yeah, so, you know, at the United Way, we we sit in a unique position where we're a nonprofit funder, right? Where we we go out into community, we tell stories, we ask people to give to us, and then we invest that money into more traditional service delivery oriented nonprofit organizations. Uh, and so, a lot of funders in this space aren't set up like that um, where they fundraise and they're not traditional nonprofits. And so from a United Way perspective, um, I've, you know, we have a president and CEO. Um, we have a chief program officer, that, that, that's me, and chief level folks, that um, chief financial officer, um, chief philanthropy officer, right, the folks that are um, at an executive level and really strategize around how do we tell stories, how do we compel people to give. Um, there's lots of, I, I think, more traditional business functions in the nonprofit space uh, that, that people aren't aware of. So we have the finance stuff, we have the administrative stuff, we have technology is a big part of what we do. It's gonna be a huge part um, of, I think, of the sector moving forward. So if you even if you have passions in those more traditional business um, settings, you can apply that passion in an environment that is also kind of uh, centered on uh, social impact. Uh, and so, you know, I think opportunities are wide and far ranging for folks to get involved. Um, you just don't have to be like a community guy. Um, but um, you can do that uh, more traditional work in a setting that is also um, making the world around you a better place. That's awesome. So is there something that you wish you knew at the beginning of your career that you would share with people? What I wish I knew, the confidence that I wish I had was that there is no uh, recipe for the work that we do. You have to, th there's a lot of intuition. Um, there's a lot of uh, um, trial and error. There's a lot of creativity. Uh, there's a lot of courage you need. And I think a lot of times what I did early in my career was look for the step-by-step -step process to accomplish something. Um, and, and, but in, instead, what the work needed was for me to pour my full self into it and provide my own idea of what we should do and then pursue that in a way um, that accomplishes significant goals for the community. Uh, and so that confidence to uh, be wrong that confidence to um, try things, um, that confidence to push against the status quo um, was something that I wish I had uh, started a little earlier, but it's certainly something that I, I fully embrace as a wily old vet okay. in, the, in the game now. Yeah. yeah. 
How would you say that someone who, let's say they're at the beginning of their career and they're like, okay, bet I want to learn from him. How could they build up that confidence at the beginning? Look for a space that lets that happen. Um, you know, it's one thing to be like, oh, this is what I want to do. This is how I operate. It's another space to be able to, to do that. Right? And there are certain environments and certain structures in our community where that's harder to do just because of the systems and, the, and that are, have been set up. Um, so look for a space where you can exercise certain muscles. Um, and you have to exercise every muscle, right? But look for opportunities to exercise your creativity, exercise your trial and error, to exercise your communication and relationship building skills. And if you can find different spaces in that and then exercise those muscles regularly, you'll be ready to go. Um, and, and I think that'll be a very appealing um, way to make the case to work um, for an organization that you feel like meet all those needs that you have as, a, as, a, as an employee. Awesome. Okay, so now we are at the point where we're gonna do the rapid final three, so some more quick ones. So we're just gonna leave the audience with some things, some of your suggestions, so you ready? Mm -hmm. All right, the first thing is something for them to read or watch. You know, the question, read or watch, uh, you probably think I'm going to say a TV show um, or a book. Watch your heroes, right? Watch day to day the people that you admire most. Watch how they move. Watch how they operate. Um, don't just watch the outcome. It's a lot of work uh, it takes for people to get to where they are. Um, watch their work, and then your outcome will be exactly what you want it to be. I love that. That was a good little spin on that. <laughs> okay, next up is a topic for them to research deeper. Um, research anti-racism. Awesome. I think a lot of times, um, you know, if you go, if you walk up to a common person, you say, "Are you racist?" Right? People are like, "No." <laughs> right? And 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 they may feel like that, but the the word anti-racist uh, requires you to be actively working against um, what you, you know, um, against the racism, right? And so I think um, research anti-racism and recognize the work that we need to do as a community uh, to really uh, make some significant impacts uh, in, in, in this world. Beautiful. And lastly, a final piece of advice for them as they go on their journey. Mm -hmm. um, whatever the work that you do, Make sure that work is in you and not on you. I think stand on that. Yeah, I think that a lot. Deep. I think a lot of times um, you know, we'll look for a job, we'll look for um, an opportunity, uh, and it's just something that we do nine to five. You clock in, you do your work, and you clock out. Uh, and you know, some of my uh, the, some of the people closest to me um, have those types of jobs. And it's not really fulfilling any internal need and any internal motivation or any internal passion. Um, just be passionate about what you do uh, and it will guarantee you success. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being here with us today and just giving us all this great advice. So well, thank we you for having me. It. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you so much for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe. And to see more Caffeinate Your Career episodes, click the link on screen.